It's good to be here today, is it not? If you would go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and put a finger in there and then turn to Luke chapter 16. And while you are doing that, I just want to say how excited I am. Um, All the things that are happening through your faithfulness and giving towards Mozambique. Um, and many of you know the most recent project that has been brought to our attention through missionaries in Mozambique is the need for a truck. But um, we have been giving for about two years to Mozambique, and even though everything is going on and borders are being closed down and uh, you know things are getting shut down all across our world, two more churches have been built in and around the city of Tet. Um, through your giving and faithfulness. So that is exciting. Um, So things are happening. We still have money and resources that we're just, it's amazing that we've, we've able to have money just kind of waiting for things to open back up. And as soon as things start to open back more, more churches are going to be built. So that is very, very exciting. Um, Also, please remember that kind of during this time, you know, in our community and in our state, we've seen an uptick in uh, coronavirus uh, cases. So because of that, we want to be mindful. We want to use wisdom. So we are halting our off-campus small groups for a couple weeks. So um, all of our off-campus small groups that are happening in homes, we're going to halt them for a few weeks. Um, But all of our discipleship classes and small groups on campus are going to be operating as uh, as usual. So, um, all right, Luke chapter 16 verse 10 says this, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is also unrighteous in much. Now, I don't know about you, maybe it's the lack of sports going on in our world. Maybe it's the, 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 maybe the excitement of having a shortened uh, baseball season and the talk of having, and, and the possibility of having a shortened NBA season uh, this summer, and the hopes cross our fingers that we'll have football in the fall. But I can't help but think about these sports. And, and you know, watching that video, I'll I tell you what, there's something just, there's something about watching Barry Sanders run. Now, don't get me wrong. I love, you know, all the great running backs, Walter Payton Sweetness, you know, all those guys, even O.J. Simpson Juice in his prime, Adrian Peterson, uh, Emmett Smith, all great running backs. But there's something about Barry Sanders. He's one of those guys that can make it look like everybody else around him is stuck in slow motion while he is running at regular speed. There's just something about it. Anyway, I've been thinking about these sports. And we all love to see somebody break a 60-yard run for a touchdown. We all love to see somebody hit the long ball yard. We love to see the 60-yard, 50, 40-yard pass hitting the receiver in stride for a touchdown. But for all of those big plays, those exciting moments that make you stand up and cheer and accidentally elbow the guy next to you in the face because you're so excited, when you really get down to it, these games, the game of football is a game of inches. It's a game of inches. Because for every 60-yard run that breaks out, it really happens because of a matter of a few inches on the line of scrimmage. A good block here, hitting your assignment there, doing what you're supposed to do in a very small way. And if you really think about it, you can drive the ball down the field 99 yards. You can drive the ball down the field 99 yards and 11 inches. But if you do not succeed in that last inch, then, you, then what does the previous 99 yards get you? For all the complex systems, for all the complex offensive strategies and defensive strategies, Football is ultimately a simple game. You run, you block, you catch. 
baseball. For all the stats and numbers, oh my goodness. I've never known another sport who is invented by mathematicians. Because they love to count everything. Every single thing in baseball they count. But for all of the, the statistics and the 120 plus years of information and data that we have to compute, you throw a ball, you catch a ball, you hit a ball with a stick. And if you can do those things well, those small things, and football, the small little disciplines, if you can get those down, that's the difference between a 15 and 1 team and a 1 and 15 team. Doing the small things, doing, taking care of the little things. And you know, in life, we're, we're like, we love watching the Madden version of sports. Any video game players, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Because a real life football score is 21 to 14. But in Madden, it's like 84 to 205. Because we all love those big moments in life, don't we? We all think we have that sometimes unrealistic expectation that growth in life, achievement in life, comes in large chunks. I'm going to gain here, I'm going to gain there, and it's going to be this amazing thing that's going to happen instantly. I'm going to invest $500, and within six months, I'm going to have $5 million. I'm going to do this, I'm going to watch what I eat and lose 50 pounds in a week. It's going to be amazing. And we often carry these unrealistic expectations of growth and achievement with us. And we find ourselves frustrated. But life in many ways is like sports. There are core disciplines. Little things. That if you and I can get a hold of these. And we can do these well. Then they will compound on a daily basis. So that we will see great results from small disciplines. This is a spiritual concept that we need to understand and carry with us in every aspect of life. Life is a game of inches. So for the next several weeks, we're going to dive into some daily principles and daily disciplines that will compound into huge gains in our lives. Now, because growth doesn't come in, in huge chunks, but small amounts. And here's the thing. Listen, guys. If we're not striving as a church and a church family to grow in God and grow in our faith, then what are we doing? You've often heard me say this before. Listen, if we're not going to do something for the kingdom of heaven, if we're not actually trying to accomplish something and move forward, if we're just here to have fun and goof off, then let's just go to, to the Masonic Lodge next door because they have free pancakes. Right? We need to be doing something. And we talk about the gospel all the time. You'll hear people talk about the gospel and the beauty of the gospel and the wondrousness of the gospel and the gospel, gospel, gospel. What does the gospel mean? Good news. So what that means is you and I are supposed to be living gospels to the world around us. So that every person you come in contact with, your life is good news to them. Some of y'all, listen, your life is good news when you're in here. When you're in the safety of these walls, oh yeah, your life is good. It's real good news. But your Facebook feed, not so much. When you get on the highway, the way you drive is not good news. The only person that you're driving is good news to is the brake man. Because he knows in six months you're wearing those brakes out. You're, calling, you're causing people to push the imaginary brake in there. They're like, oh, like, you know. Our lives should be good news to everyone around us. But so often our lives are only good news to the select few whom we choose. 
And we should constantly be striving to be closer to God, to be more patient, to be more loving, to point fewer fingers and to hold out open hands, to pray instead of point fingers. So if we're not striving, then what are we doing? What's the point? Listen, God did not call you simply to mark time until the day that you die. God did not call you just to to kill hours and kill months and kill years. He's placed you on this earth for a specific purpose. And it is up to you and it is up to me to decide and determine and realize and discover what that purpose is. And then to be moving forward constantly toward that purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11 says this, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by the one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, if you skip down to verse 31, sorry, that's verse 30. Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But, but earnestly desire the greatest gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Let's pray together over the reading of the word. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. We thank you for your word. Your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray that our minds would be alert, our hearts would be open, so that we could hear what your Holy Spirit would speak to us through your word. And I pray that as we hear your word, as we, as we um, absorb your word into our heart and our spirit, that your word would change us from the inside out. That we would look more like, we would talk more like, we would love more like your son Jesus when we leave this place than we did when we entered into this place. I pray that lives would be changed. I pray for the miracle of salvation and transformation today. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me start by asking this question. Has anybody ever read any books on leadership or personal growth in here? Raise your hands, yeah. Um, I've read quite a few books on personal growth and leadership growth. And if I may, allow me to share um, some of my frustration. Because a lot of times, you know, you read these books, and they're supposed to help. But a lot of times it seems like The attitude, the approach to personal growth and leadership growth is this. The book tells you, okay, you need to find out everything that you're really, really bad at. All of those, you just just put them in a pile. Everything that you are horrible at. Identify that. Now, are you feeling really bad about yourself? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Now you must pour all of your effort, all all of your strength, all of your focus into everything that you're really, really bad at and you hate. And if you don't, you're even worse. And if you get frustrated, that's your fault. So a lot of times I read these books and I just get get frustrated at myself. I'm not this, I'm not that. I have this weakness, I have that weakness. So often, books on personal growth and leadership and our approach to improving ourselves, we are aiming at the wrong targets. We are aiming at the things in our lives 
that are not gifts from God. Now it is my purpose today to kind of challenge you and challenge myself to kind of flip this dynamic on its ear and take a more biblical approach as given to us by 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because it says here, this idea creates this perpetual cycle of frustration where we are never good enough. We're constantly focusing on our weaknesses and all the things in our lives that drag us down. Now, if we can be real honest, how many of y'all in here have weaknesses? Come on, raise your hand. It's a safe space. We can, I raise two hands. We all have weaknesses. We all have things in our lives that, that we would love to change. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 says, or verse 30 says, but earnestly desire the greatest gifts or the best gifts. Some translations say the highest gifts. Now let me ask you this question. The best gifts according to who? God. But does God tell you which are the best gifts? Because he gives, Paul gives a whole list of gifts in this passage. Healings, miracles, speaking tongues, word of faith, word of knowledge, all these things. It's given as one big list. So, so who determines out of just this list which one's the best? Is there like a J.D. Power and Associates for the Holy Spirit? Patience, this year's J.D. Power and Associates, top winner for the best gift. Is there like an Academy Awards for the greatest spiritual gifts? And Patience is coming up there going, you like me. You really like me. I love to thank the Holy Spirit and the Academy for making me this year's best, greatest gift. Is there a hierarchy of gifts? No. What Paul does is he lays out this big list of gifts. And then he challenges the people. You seek the greatest gift. How do we know to do that? How do we know which one is the greatest gift? Simple. Yes, they're all the greatest gifts. They all are. But the trick, the key, is the greatest gift for you is not going to be the greatest gift for me. See, what God has called you to is not going to be what God necessarily has called me to. See, we're all different. And the problem, I think, with the modern church, the American church, is that we all want everybody to look and dress and talk and act the exact same way. And we often think that, or we often put out there in the church that you have to believe before you can belong at this church. And really what we really mean, the subtext is, is you have to believe exactly what we believe and then if you behave, we might let you belong. But each and every one of us is different, created in the likeness of God. And God has given each and every one of us passions, talents, desires, and giftings that are unique and different. So why would we spend all of our time pursuing somebody else's gifting and passion? Why would we spend all of our time trying to develop things in our lives that are not giftings and passions, things that God has not gifted us with? Are you all with me so far? earnestly desire the best gifts. In fact, Matthew 25, 14 through 30 says, it tells a well-known parable of the talents where a wealthy business owner gives talents, which is a measurement of money to be invested, to invest and are blessed. One buries and is cursed. But notice that each are given different amounts and each employee is only held responsible for the talents that they are given. They are not held responsible for talents they are not given. They're only held responsible with what they're given. So why do we ignore what God has given us to invest and beat our heads against a wall over trying to develop 
something that is not our gifting. We need to understand that your weakness is somebody else's talent. So stop targeting somebody else's bullseye. So we've got to identify the natural giftings that God has given us. The bullseyes in our lives. Identify what you do well. Now listen, this is the the main point of today. Identify the gifting that God has given you and then expand at the edges. That is the key to personal growth and discipleship and spiritual disciplines in your life. Identify the giftings that God has given you and then expand at the edges. Now I have three questions here that are going to help us to identify spiritual giftings and what God has blessed us with. So in order to hone in on these God-given gifts, here they are. Question number one, write this down. What in my life fills me spiritually and what drains me? What fills me spiritually and what drains me? Now we need to understand first and foremost is that there's a difference between being tired and being drained spiritually. Many times I know that I'm operating in what God has created me to do. What God has put me on this earth to do, which is pastor. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many days that I come home drained. I'm just, I, oh, I can't, I can't. That's okay. Because if you think about it, the things that you're the most passionate about are the things that drain you physically the most. Why? Because you care about them. And the things that drain you don't drain other people. Why? Because they don't care about them. They don't care. And that's not a bad thing. It's just not high on their priority list. So we get upset like, oh, they don't care. I'm the only one who cares about this. Yes, yes, you are. Why? Because God has placed that mantle and that burden upon you and no one else. If you are a leader in this place, let me give you the, the, the best leadership advice I ever got. And I got it from my wife. I had an event, I was a youth pastor, very first ministry position. I had this event, and we advertised it was going to be great. It was going to be amazing. One kid showed up. So it's me, four adults, and one kid. And you know, you know, let's, let's just be real. If one kid is going to show up to a youth group event, it's that one kid. That one kid that although you would never verbalize it or say it or pray it, in your mind you think, oh Lord, if only one kid shows up, please don't let it be so-and-so. And lo and behold, who does God send to the event? So-and-so. I'm so glad you're here. Let's go have fun for the next eight hours, just us. And I was so, I was just, I was like, oh, I'm ready to give up. I was, you know, tearing my clothes and putting sackcloth and ashes on. I was horrible. In the morning, I was, you know, kicking around in the living room floor. And Talina's like, get up. What are you doing? Nobody cares. Nobody got excited over this event. She said, of course not. Nobody is going to be more excited about your event than you are. So you get excited And you make other people excited. It's so tiring. Yes, it is. But nobody is going to be more excited about your stuff than you are. See, God has given you stuff. He's given you passions. He's given you dreams and ideas. He's given you plans. He's given you things that you can do. And nobody else is going to be as excited about those things as you are. But lean into that. That's okay. That's all right. Because those things, even though they drain you, I don't, how many people can relate to this? You, you go home and you're just physically exhausted, but you know that you've done something that you're passionate about. And although you're exhausted, you think to yourself, I can get up and do it again tomorrow. But then there are times... That you get home and yeah, you're tired physically from doing something, but you've been doing something that is draining your spirit. And you think to yourself, I don't care if it's the next five years. I'm never doing that again. We need to identify the things that fill us up spiritually. That fill our hearts. Fill our souls spiritually. 
identify those things. Because for some of you, it could be something highly creative like writing or art or things like that. And some of you, the mere mention of from my mouth, those things, you're going, uh, uh, uh. sit down and write my feelings. Uh. No thanks. But there are other things that you get excited about. That is your expression of worship. And other people are like, really? That's your expression of worship? Uh. No thanks. Identify those things. Ask yourself the question, what in my life fills me spiritually and what drains me? Luke chapter 10 gives the example of Mary and Martha, two sisters. Very, very different in personality. One wanted to clean and take care of everybody. One wanted to do the work of hospitality while the other wanted to sit at Jesus' feet and have a love in. Hippie style, just sit there and I love you Jesus. The problem is, which one was better? The answer is yes. Because one was better for Mary and the other was better for Martha. And the problem that Martha ran into was she was upset that Mary didn't have the same list of priorities that she did. Listen, don't Martha somebody else's Mary. And don't marry somebody else's Martha. One of my favorite sayings is Shemise always says, don't yuck my yum. She's got food and she's like, I'm going to eat this. And you're like, that's the grossest thing I've ever seen. She, she goes, shut up, don't yuck my yum. It may not be good to you, but it's good to me. So don't yuck somebody else's spiritual yum. The next question. What am I doing that somebody else can naturally do better? What am I doing that somebody else can naturally do better? Now, Hear me. There will always be things that we must do. There will always be skills that we must acquire in life that don't have anything to do with our giftings. There are skills that we, we must acquire. I learned early on in life that mowing my father's lawn was not a passion at 12 years of age. But it is still something that I had to do on a weekly basis. It was a skill that I had to develop. See, there are times in life that you must develop skills, that you must do things that aren't necessarily your passions, and that's okay. We have to develop those things. But is that my, your priority? Is that the beating of your heart? No. No, it's not. But there are still skills that we must have, but there's a difference between a talent and a skill. I'm going to say that again. There's a difference between a talent and a skill. Now, I learned sports, for me, is a skill. Something that I must develop through effort and work. But no matter how hard I put effort and work, I will only be so fast. Because I don't, you probably can't tell by looking at me, but this body was not built for speed. Just wasn't. I know you're probably looking at me thinking, that dude's so fast. No. <laughs> nope. To, to the buffet line, maybe. <laughs> and if you're faster than me, I'll trip you. <laughs> no. But I, I love basketball. I love baseball. I love football. But those are skills in my life. It's not a talent. Skill is something that you must develop. And we have to develop. But, but a talent is thing that hap something that happens naturally. But this is what happens. We spend all of our time and our effort trying to develop the skills. And we ignore the talents that God has given us. So look at it from God's perspective. He gives you talents that you may use for his uplifting. And he gifts those talents to you. But what do you and I do? We ignore the natural talents that God has given us. And we develop and put all of our heart and soul into the skills, which really are somebody else's talents. And so when it comes time to use our talents, what do we do? We phone it in, depending and leaning upon the natural talent that God has given us. How do you think that makes the Holy Spirit feel? Do you think it, that cannot honor his heart? It grieves his heart because we are neglecting and taking light of the precious talent that God has given us by not developing it, by not holding it in the same honor and esteem that God has held it. 
See, for me, money and budgets, personal budgets, it's a skill that I've acquired. But I found out that it is a talent that my wife has. Oh, man, she's, I mean, you give, give her an empty ledger and an afternoon. There are times I'm just, you know, I decided for her birthday, I'll just go and make all these kind of crazy purchases that she has to rectify. <laughs> and just say, have at it. I'm going to take the kids and let you be by yourself and, rec- and, and balance the books. And she'd be like, yeah! Thank you. You do love me. So why? I learned something early on in my marriage. See, for me, it was very different because my father always kept the books. So I thought growing up, that's the man's job, man, keep the book. I mean, so men, men do, men keep the books. Had nothing to do with men and women. It had to do with the fact that my mother hated keeping the books and my father loved it. So when we get married, I put away my, my pride and said, you know what? It's a skill for me, but it's a talent for you. So there are people that God has put in your life that have talents for your skills. So it's a matter of getting together and say, what can you do naturally better than me? And let's help each other out. Question number three. What can I do naturally that others cannot? You see, underdeveloped talents are neglected talents. And this is the other side of that coin. Your talent... It's somebody else's skill. Now, some of, you, some of y'all, you, you have talents that are my skills. But me, I have talents that are your skills. For some of you, the sheer thought of standing up here and speaking to a crowd for a half an hour, just, uh, no thanks. Me? No big deal. Why? That's just simply the way that God made me. So I'm operating in the talents that God has given me. But there are other things that you ask me to do. Don't ask me to wire a house for electricity. No way. No way. You know, I know enough, um, you know, handyman stuff to get myself in trouble. But electricity is something I don't... I'll be honest with you all, it takes me five minutes to, to, to get, I can turn every breaker off in the house and I'm still going to the light switch going, goo, 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 thinking I'm going to get shocked. I, it, it's just, I can't help but think of two pitchers, two Hall of Fame pitchers, Nolan Ryan and Kurt Wakefield, both Hall of Fame pitchers, completely different. They developed their pitch, and every other pitch that they threw hung off of their pitch. Nolan Ryan, number one, the Nolan Ryan Express, the fastball, throwing that thing 100 miles an hour. Kurt Wakefield, the knuckleball. Every single pitch that they threw was set up by their primary pitch. And trust me, you get Nolan Ryan trying to throw a knuckleball, it's not pretty. You get Kurt Wakefield trying to throw a fastball at 100 miles an hour, it ain't pretty either. But each man found out their pitch, their, what their gift was. And they developed that, and then every other pitch hung off of that. And that's where the balance comes in. That's where the growth comes in. Like I said earlier, the main point of this message today and the takeaway that I want everybody to have is this. You find out what God has gifted you with, then expand at the edges. Find out your gifting. Find out what you're good at. Find out what feeds your spirit. Then expand at the edges. Because that's where the balance comes in. The expansion at the edges. Because on one side of the coin, you have some of us in this room, you have the last, over the last several years, you have been just beating your head against the wall, only focusing on your weaknesses. And it's left you frustrated. It's left you upset. You may not be a naturally organized person and you've just been trying your best to, to live that life and be captain organized. And it's left you frustrated. But on the other side of the coin, 
Some of us, some of you in this place, you have, you've, you know who you are and, and who God has made you to be. But you've used that as an excuse to insulate yourself from everyone else. Not expanding, not stretching, not growing. Oh, I'm going to live in my little world, in my little comfort zone, and I will not expand from those. Those are the kind of people that they live their life on what God has called them to do, but it's so funny that God never seems to call them to do anything. I'm sorry, I'm not called to do that. Has anybody ever heard that? They say, hey, can you do that? I'm sorry, I'm not called to do that. Let me tell you something as your pastor. There are certain mandates in Scripture that are universal mandates. Taking care of the widows and orphans, missions, salvation. Those things are universal. Go into all the nations and preach the gospel and make disciples. That's not go and make disciples if you feel called to. Guess what? You and I were called to do it. It doesn't matter if you feel called to it. The Word of God has called you to do it. And so thus you and I should be a part of that. But so many people say, I'm sorry, I don't feel called to do that. Really? God hasn't called you to support missions? You need to go back and read your word. Because he's called you. So you have two sides of this coin. People either getting so <clears throat> frustrated and upset, and really what they're doing is they're living in a works-based salvation, trying to be good enough, trying to have control over their own spiritual growth. And then you have people on the other side that are using their callings on their life as an excuse not to grow. As you expand at the edges, it's going to lead you to the uncomfortable. Expanding at the edges is going to lead you to being uncomfortable. It's going to lead you out of what's normal and familiar to expand in areas that you're not naturally good at. But the great thing is, in identifying what you're good at and expanding at the edges, your discomfort, your area of discomfort is comfort adjacent. Because you're expanding at the edges. Expanding at the edges. Let me give you an example in my life. If you need a creative idea or a really a, a an idea download or just a dump of ideas, like a, like a garbage truck just dumping stuff out, come to me. Pastor Mark, I want to do this. So I want, need an idea for this. What do you got? In a matter of seconds, I can just... That's just how my mind works. But for me, expanding at the edges is then now that I've just had all these ideas flood my mind and I'm just throwing them out there like mud against the wall. Like, here, try this, try this, try this. How I need to expand at the edges is, okay, now that I've dumped all these ideas out, we need to I identify the good ones and then start moving into plan of action to execute those. Because I would tell you, if you need a lot of great ideas, come talk to me, but don't come back a week later and ask me, hey, what were those ideas? Oh, they came, I just dumped them out, and that's it. That's an area that I need to expand at. So we all have those areas. If everybody would stand to your feet. Like I said at the beginning, if we're not growing, then what are we doing? If we're not expanding the kingdom. So did you guys realize that this applies not just to you personally, but to your family? Your family has a DNA. Your family has an identity. Your family has a calling. As a family unit, there's a reason why God paired your three, four, five, uh, you know, people together. He assembled your special brand of crazy for a reason. And so often with our families, we just mark time. Not actually living in to the DNA and the reason why God created your family and, and put your kids with you and you with your kids. He did it on purpose. It's intentional. Do you know this church has a DNA? Why do you think we've been echoing it and saying it every week for the last two years? I'm hoping we're finally at the point to where if I gave you all a piece of paper, you could write down our four pillars of DNA. Because our church has a unique calling. And if we're not going to operate in our, our unique calling, if we're not going to operate 
in the giftings that God has given us, then what are we doing? Listen, I'm not here to pass our church to steal another church's anointing. I don't want to steal another church's gifting. I want to operate in ours and see God move through that. I don't want to go copy another church. I don't want to be another church. I want to be crossroads and be what God has called us to be. So this morning, I'm going to pray over you. If everybody would bow your heads, close your eyes. It's a very simple prayer. I'm going to pray over you and then we're going to dismiss. For some of you in this place, the first step for you is identifying, number one, that you need God in your life. You need Jesus as your Savior. You've been frustrated. You've been beating your head against the wall. You feel like you're not growing, that you're stuck in life. And the reason being is because you've not given your life over to Him and made Him the Lord and Savior of your life. That, that's the doorway into personal growth. That's the doorway to salvation. That is the bridge to eternity. And I challenge you to be brave enough to cross that bridge. Brave enough to open that door and allow the Spirit of God to enter into your heart. If that's you today, then he's just a call away. Just cry out to him wherever you're at. Just call his name and say, God, forgive me. Come into my heart. And salvation can be yours today. And for those who've already prayed that prayer, I think our prayer today, I'm going to pray that God would help identify the unique giftings and passions and talents that he has given you so that then we can identify what God has, how he, who He created us to be and then expand at the edges, growing into those areas of discomfort so He can grow us and we can grow His kingdom. Let me pray over you today. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now. I worship you. I praise you. I ask right now, Holy Spirit, for those who recognize and realize that they need you as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray that they would cry out to you. I pray that you would hear their cries. I pray that you would sweep into their hearts. That they may be born again. Awakened to new spiritual realities. Lord, I pray for every other person in this room. Lord, I pray that you would help us to identify how we are uniquely made and uniquely gifted. Just like 1 Corinthians chapter 12 lays out the giftings of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would distribute and administer those gifts to us. Give us those gifts that we would seek the best gifts for us and how you've created us to be. And as we do that, Lord, I pray that we would be brave enough to expand at the edges, moving into those areas of discomfort, moving into those areas where, where we fall short and we are lacking, knowing that you will help us, that in our weakness you are made strong. I pray that we would leave from this place growing in you, moving in you, and moving forward. We thank you, God. We worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you for being here today. You are dismissed. Have an amazing week. Remember, our off-campus small groups are, are being kind of held up and, and, and canceled for the next couple weeks. But our on-campus groups are still uh, moving forward. Have an amazing week. We'll see you back next Sunday.